You may take off your mask. Okay. Okay. It, it's Miss, Mr. Mrs. Adams and Mr. Talbot. Right. Mr. They're cousins, Mrs. Oh, okay. Adams and Mr. Talbot. Forgive me. That's fine. Uh, would you kindly swear, Mrs. Ms. Adams? My name is Joanne Bernice Adams. Okay. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. And we'll swear the gentleman as well, please. Dwayne Disney Talbot. Oh, sorry. I'll repeat that. Dwayne Disney Talbot. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence uh, I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swan. Thank you, Council. Thank you. I, I just asked for a moment. Yes. Um, this will be start. Can can my cousin have um some Sorry? Water? Can my cousin have some water to dry? Yeah. Okay, that's okay. We thought it was one person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Miss Joanne, Mrs. Joanne Bernice Adams, my apologies. On the 6th of June of this year, you, along with your cousin, Mr. Duane Disney Talbot, made a claim to the Commission of Inquiry. Is that correct? That is correct. And you made a claim as a descendant of Mr. John Samuel Talbot. Is that correct? That is correct. And Mr. John Samuel Talbot, he was a resident of where, madam? Town. And in respect of Mr. What was relation between yourself and Mr. John Samuel Talbot? He was my great grandfather. Do you know Mr. Duane Disney Talbot? Yes, I do. Yeah. Who is he to you? He's my cousin, his mother, and my father were first cousins. Now in respect of the reason that you are here today you know why you're here today yes tell me why you're here today i'm here today to give evidence to show that um john samuel tobit was not adequately compensated for his land and that the whole process of the force at expropriation was um unjust okay thank you now in that regard you have given a statement to the Commission of Inquiry, setting that out? Yes, I have. 
And you also, in aid of that statement, wish to rely on two documents which compass your presentation by yourself and your cousin, Mr. Talbot. Yes, and the exhibits. As well as 17 exhibits which you wish, wish to rely on. Yes. Okay. I'll take them one at a time. Now the statement you gave is dated the 25th of November, 2020. If you see that statement, the original statement, you'd recognize it, certainly. Yes. And you actually have that statement there. I do. I was going to ask you to let me have a look at it first. I crave indulgence, Madam Chair, and your members. Now, what is that there, madam? This is my statement of witness. And that's the statement that you had signed? Yes, it is. And you see your signature there? Yes, it is. Okay. I mean, I've attended and admitted as exhibit JBA1, madam chair. JBA1. JBA1. Statement dated the 6th of June 2020, Council? 25th of November 2020, Madam Chair. Thank you. So enter. Thank you. Now, Mrs. Adams, you also prepared a document upon which which yourself and Mr. Talbot wish to rely submission to the Commission of Inquiry land loss. That's correct? Yes, it is. Dated November 20, 2020? Yes, it is. And there's a two, one stated November 26, 2020. Pardon me? I have one dated November 20, 2020, yes. And you also have an updated one dated November, November 26. The one dated November 20. Mm -hmm. Going to ask Madam Chair that, that is tenant and exhibited 
as exhibit JBA2. And me, Councillor. It's, is that the joint submission? It is, Madam Chair. And it's dated November 20th? That's so, Madam. And, and 2020? That okay. is so. Thank you. So entered. You also, Mrs. Adams, have document submission to the Commission of Inquiry Land Loss dated November 26, 2020. Yes. You basically updated the what was just Exhibit 2. You yes. Asked that, that document, which is an update of Exhibit 2, that, that the tenant admitted as, as JBA3. So the document dated the 26th of November, which updates the exhibit one is now entered as exhibit JBA three. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, Mrs. Adams, you also prepared a third document which comprises of 17 exhibits upon which you wish to reply, rely? Yes. It just has a picture of Tucker Stone dating back on the cover page, that's correct? Yes. I'd ask Madam Chair that this document be 10 admitted as exhibit JBA4. It's going to be 4A to 17 or just 4? Because you say there are 17 documents within it. I uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I am going to, for each exhibit, when she I, speaks to each one, you'll number it. I'll time. number it all using four, but okay. I'll use another, either letter or a Roman numeral to identify it. Very well. Thank so you. So the document um, comprising 17 exhibit uh, is labeled, entered as exhibit JBA4. Thank you. No, Madam, Mrs. Adams, could I kindly ask you in respect of your statement, which is an exhibit JBA1, could I just ask you to read for us the, what you have as paragraph four, your witness statement? Yes. That's a statement um, dated the 6th of June. Mm -hmm. It's no, it's dated the 25th day of November 2020. It's the witness statement, which is JBA one. One, one, Madam Chair. Four. Our claim is that our ancestor, John Samuel Tobit, was not adequately compensated and that the whole process of the forced expropriation was unjust. Thank you. Now, can I take you to exhibit JBA2, which is a document, well, I'm sorry. You indicated that JBA2 and JBA3, which I'll indicate, JBA2 is a submission to the Commission of Inquiry Land Loss, dated November 20th, 2020. And you also indicated JBA3, 
document with the same title. However, it's dated November 26, 2020. You recall saying that? Yes. I'm just going to ask you to take us through JBA 3, which is not the one dated November 26, 2020. And when you are finished, you could tell us what's the difference between the document dated November 26 and the one dated November 20. Okay. But take okay. us through the one that is November 26. And I'll intersperse with questions, but you may go ahead. This submission is hereby presented to the Commission of Inquiry established on 31st October 2019 by the Premier, the Honorable E. David Burke, JP, MP, and directed to inquire into historic losses of citizens' property in Bermuda, in keeping with the mandate of the House of Assembly as expressed in its resolution of July. 4th July 2014. This presentation will give evidence that has been discovered thus far by us, Joanne Bernice Adams and Dwayne Disney Tobit, in regards to John Samuel Tobit. We hereby claim that he was not adequately compensated. The whole process of the forced expropriation was unjust. Who was he? Who was this John Samuel Tobit? He was a husband, a son a brother, an uncle, a father, a grandfather, a farmer, an upstanding member of the Town community who served as a trustee for the school. He was a free black man. He was our great grandfather. John Samuel Tobit was born on November 11th, 1860. Exhibit one. In Tucker's town. Okay. The document that you refer to as Exhibit One is a Methodist. Baptism, baptismal entry. Yes, it is. And somebody presses. And three lines from the bottom. So, so just, just, a, just a moment. Somebody. No, what do you have there, madam? What's that? No, just here. This is um, the Methodist baptism taken from um, Hallett's book of baptism and um, births and deaths from. That's fine. Yeah. And that document you exhibit as proof of the birth date of John Samuel Talbot. Yes. Okay. Madam Chair, I'd ask that that document, which is labeled Exhibit 1, that it is tendered and admitted as Exhibit JBA4A. JBA4A. Thank you. Answered. Thank you. You may continue, Madam. Okay. He was born to James and Joanna Tobit Nee Darrell, Exhibit 2, and he had 12 brothers and sisters. And Exhibit 2 shows the Methodist groom marriage of James Tobit to Joanna Darrell on March 8th. 1849. I'd ask 
Add asset document, which is labeled as Exhibit 2, which is a Methodist groom marriage and entry from it, that it be tend and admitted as Exhibit J, B, A, 4, B. So we have it as Exhibit J, B, A, 2. Has she spoken to it yet? She just did just prior to in, in her evidence. Because the last one I have is JBA, JBA 4A, which is, the, which is the Methodist baptism certificate. So she's now going on to speak of the marriage certificate. Certificate. Well, an entry in the Methodist. Methodist groom marriage, which has been taken from the registry. And that's JBA for B. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, may I proceed? Yes. Thanks. Let's Sorry. continue. Continue, ma'am. John Samuel Talbot read Roosevelt Winifred Smith, Exhibit 3, also of Tuckerstown, St. George's, on June 14, 1900. You may proceed. I'll come to them after. Just proceed with the, your presentation. Okay. They had six children, all born in Tuckerstown, Almira, Dorcas, Helen, and Amy and two stillbirths. Let the record show that Dwayne Disney Tobit is the grandson of Helen Tobit by way of his mother, Edith Claretta Tobit Usher, Helen's daughter, exhibit four, and Joanne Bernice Adams, Nee Davis, is the granddaughter of Amy Bernice Tobit Davis by way of her father, Eric Melvin Davis, Amy's son, exhibit five. James Tobit, the father of John Samuel Tobit and husband of Joanna Tobit, originally purchased 103 or more acres in 11 lots of property in Tuckerstown in 1862 from the heirs of Benjamin Dickinson Harvey. Our great grandfather, John Samuel Tobit, was built two lots of land in Tuckerstown. In 1896, he received seven acres of land from his father, James Tobit. His mother, Joanna Tobit, left him 7.5 acres on the water side, indicated as lot tan, colored, originally colored brown, in the map that accompanied her will. John Samuel Tobit therefore acquired a total of 14.5 acres of land in Tuckerstown from his parents. In 1921, John Samuel Tobit was awarded 1,000 pounds for his two pieces of property. However, records indicate that instead of receiving compensation for the full seven acres that his father bequeathed to him, he was only compensated for five acres for which he received 400 pounds. As noted in the Royal Gazette on February 24th, 1921, John received 600 pounds for his seven point acre waterside lot 
And I would just like to say there is um, the documentation, exhibit nine, where he received $1,000. It clearly states $1,000. And then how we found out the difference is because in a court case, um, the, a witness for the Bermuda Development Company used Joan's example of um, having got, having received 400 pounds for five acres. And that five acres would have really should have been the seven that he would have gotten from his father. And he would, so therefore it, the balance would have been 600 pounds for the 7.5 acres that he received from his mother. The following evidence will exemplify the inequity, inequality, prejudicial, and ad hoc manner in which awards were arbitrarily meted out, and how the Bermuda Development Company systematically removed hundreds of Bermudians from their homes, obliterating their health, welfare, and livelihood. Ad hoc manner of making awards. Gosling always represented the company, i.e. Bermuda Development Company. Sometimes he offered straight cash, sometimes cash and land and a home elsewhere. The outcomes varied. In some cases, Gosling fattened his offer and an out of court settlement was reached. In others, the jury improved the company's offer. This supports our theory that there was no rhyme nor reason as to how awards were determined and or issued. It was fully at the discretion of F. Gordon Gosling when he visited with people. As he also served as witness for Bermuda Development Company, he had a major impact on swaying the jury because he had all the information on what others had been offered and subsequently what they accepted. Conflicting views of Tucker's town, community land. And we present this because there are so many differences depending on different people's perspectives of what Tucker's Town land was actually like based on their views and observations. By 1900, Tucker's Town was a tightly knit isolated community. A few whites remained, but it was fundamentally a black society. There were two churches, a general store, a school, a cricket pitch, a post office, and a cemetery on the knoll behind the church. Boats were still being built, pigs were slaughtered, potatoes grated, vegetables were dispatched by car to Hamilton for sale. The rhythms of life were woven through these activities. Children were given the rudiments of education. This is the Tucker's town that our great grandfather knew and was a part of. This is where he was born, his parents and their parents before them. This is where he read Ma Tobit and she birthed his four daughters of which two were all grandparents. In 1907, when the Honorable F. Godwin, Godwin Gosling brought property on the point or the main, as it was called in the old day, Tucker's town was sparsely inhabited. Less than a third of the land was arable and had little economic value. Sweet potatoes formed the principal crop and fishing the chief occupation. It appears that while there were decent folk among them in general, they were a degenerate lot. The communal life left much to be desired. Intermarriage for generations had undermined both health and morale. They were a law amongst themselves and the army of authority seemed to lack, lack power to control them. B.D. Tobit thought all the property, bought all the property for little more than a song. Tobit grew onions and potatoes and kept the school. The disrespect and contempt demonstrated by the writer in this discourse is prejudice and more than likely represents the sentiment of much of the white population at that time toward the black population of the day. This land, which your petitioners desire to acquire has been of little economic value to the colony and has remained in a backward and undeveloped state for upwards of a century. Less than one third of it is arable. The remainder being chiefly rocky hills and sand dunes. It is very sparsely colonated and populated, there being few, far fewer inhabitants to the square mile than in any other part of the colony. And I would like to say that stands today in Tuckerstown. It's far few residents per square mile than it is in any other part of Bermuda. 
The land is described by B.D. Tolbert as stated in Royal Gazette, February 11, 1921. He speaks of its worth in vegetables from his property, which included his banana plantation, summer crops of melons, corn, etc., and lemons. He also sold wood and timber and harvested seaweed. Comments attributed to the sale of the land, however, regarding its value and assets were not considered, excuse me, during the purchase of the land. This allowed for the Bermuda Development Company to make lower price sales. The contours of the property are unsurpassed. Delightful valleys winding through coral hills from 20 to 25 feet in height along the line of play. Well wooded with cedars, oleanders, bougainville and hibiscus lending to the most fascinating color scheme to the whole. The contours are inviting to the Gulf architect to construct unique and scientific put putting greens consisting with the length of hill demanded. In contrast to the previous statement, this rendering made by Charles Blair MacDonald in 1921 about Tucker's Town is one of awe and beauty. Design and construction were not easy, for only in the valleys was the coral rock covered with a six inch layer of soil. The area had been used for growing onions, potatoes, and Easter lilies. Again, we see some of the crops that were there were mentioning Easter lilies here. The resilience community of Tucker's Town utilized the land to grow different crops at different times. This is how they sustain themselves within their community. Some may like to hear a word of the inhabitants of this sylvan retreat. With one or two exceptions, they are all of African descent and kinder or more hospitable, hospitable people are not to be found in Bermuda's Fair Isles. When I first visited the place some 30 years ago, there were only two or three houses and an old wooden chapel in the valley. Now on the hillside and, and in wooded lands are to be seen the cottages of succeeding generations and a fine store a fine stone Methodist church and a schoolhouse nearly finished, only awaiting the assistance of persons kindly disposed to the interest of education. For the people of Takistan are not unmindful of its benefits. As a rule, the children like their parents are social and intelligent and strangers are kindly welcomed. To those who may have a shade of doubt or to the visitor from the States, I say, let them visit this charming spot and his genial sons of the soil will guide them safely by and into the numerous caves and hollows of their ancestral domain. Or in gig or whaleboat, sail or row them to the picturesque and historic island and circling Castle Harbor. These same caves mentioned here are discussed in the February 24th, 1921 edition of the Royal Gazette in the case of Worshipful THH Otterbridge MCP, who puts the caves forward as an asset. It is refuted by Mr. Godwin Gosling, secretary of the Bermuda Development Company, who states that they're not safe and not capable for development. But as this shows, um, they obviously were safe because they continuously took people there. A century ago, however, a very different community called Tucker's Town home. Along its shores and centered around pockets of rich arable land, Black Bermudians farmed, fished, and built boats in humble but happy obscurity. Their peace was occasionally interrupted by carriage loads of tourists on day trips from Hamilton and picnickers from St. David's Island who came to gaze at, in wonder at those natural arches. But, in Tucker's Town between 2020 and 2023, everything changed utterly. A community literally vanished, almost in the bibbling twinkling of an eye. Oh, Tucker's Town lost everything, everything but its name. As the saying goes, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And these various descriptions certainly illustrate a beautiful and bountiful Tucker's town until those horrible days of the expropriation dislodged my ancestors. Okay. 
Please proceed. Dwayne Bo. Mr. Talbot. Yeah. You wish to continue the presentation? Yeah, sure. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm referring to the purchase prices in comparison to the purchase of the property of John Samuel um, Tobit. Yes. Um, you see, on December the 9th, 1920, a gentleman by the name of Benedict Priest was offered 2,900 pounds for his four acres, but he was awarded 4,000 pounds. So just getting off the math, based on this, um, John Tobin could have been awarded 12,500 pounds. Um, and that would be exhibit 12. Sorry, just a moment, please. Mm -hmm. You're referring to a Royal Gazette article dated December 9, 1920? Yes, sir. I'd ask Madam Chair, not Craven Dodger. And the date of that? It's dated December 9, 1920, Madam. I crave your indulgence. And that's the Royal Gazette. Now tell me, please, Council. Uh, we have um, the new witness. So, are we starting over the exhibits afresh? That's why I'd ask for a moment. Okay. Uh, Madam, Certainly. what I, sorry. Just let me know. Yes, what I had done to allow Mrs. Adams to flow and us not stopping each time, I was going to allow her to complete and at the end I would have asked to tender the exhibits. Now, Mr. Talbot has started. I just wanted to ensure that it flows because if I now tender what he's relying on, I would then be going back to her to Quiet. And the number and would, would not flow. So I, I'll just ask for just 10 seconds and then I, before I let him continue. Just let me know when you're ready. Thank you. What I propose, Madam Chair, I just ask Mr. Talbot just to allow us to just go back to Mrs. Adams. Let me tender these documents so that we, we have a sequence that, that flows and then we will return to him shortly. So we're going to ask you to pause, Mr. Talbot, and we're gonna go back to you, um, Ms. Adams, so that we can have the exhibits numbered sequentially. No, Mrs. Adams, I had, you're on page two of your, mm -hmm. what is JBA two, and you had, I had stopped you after you had given evidence in respect of the marriage. Okay. Correct. With John Samuel Talbot, mm -hmm. with Rosalie Winifred Smith. Correct. Okay. Winifred. And that was the marriage certificate council, JBA 4B. That. I crave indulgence. Mm -hmm. 
The, the next item, Mrs. Adams, is the will of James Talbot. Um, no, the next item was exhibit for the charity lineage of Dwayne Disney Talbot. That's the item exhibit marked exhibit four. four. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you to speak directly into I'm the sorry. mic so we can hear you. Please. The next item, which was listed exhibit four, shows the lineage of Dwayne Disney Talbot to James and um, Joanna Talbot. Uh, the, the document is labeled exhibit, no, four. exhibit four. I'd ask that that document be tended and admitted as exhibit JBA4. C. So that's the one that shows the lineage between James Talbot and, and Joanna Talbot to John Talbot to Helen to Edith to Dwayne. And that's JBA four. So for me, please C, counsel. For C. For C, okay. Yes, that's the question I was going to ask if we're moving away from the num Very numbering. Well. So we're fine. Thank you. The map. Then exhibit five on page two. Which is my lineage through my father to my grandfather, my grandmother, Amy, to John Samuel Tobit, and then on to James Tobit and Joanna Tobit. Repeat that, please. You said exhibit five of page five shows the shows the lineage of myself. Joanne has Davis. That's my name before I was married. <laughs> um, to my father, my grandmother. My great grandfather, John Samuel Talbot, and his parents, Williams and Joanna Dow. I'm Talbot. Looking at her maiden name. I'd ask that this document be tendered as JBA4D. Madam Chair. J. B. A. 4D. A. 4D. D. Mm -hmm. Very well. Thank you. The next one, exhibit six, which is the local cottage um, that indicates the sale of property to James Tobit in Tuckerstown. As a document be exhibited as JBA. For E, he has an egg. For E as an egg? Yes, Madam Chair. Yes. The next document, seven, was a transcription of the will, last will and testament of James Tobit as transcribed by Leonie Junis. And we will seek to get the original document. I'd ask that this document be marked at this time, not tended as an exhibit. This is a transcription. I am not giving evidence, but I think it, the microfilm had been used, but this is a transcription of what was there. So I would not ask at this time for it to be tended as an exhibit. I just ask that it is marked at this time, JBA for F. JBA for F. 
four M. But F F. Okay. But marked, but not an exhibit until we have Did add us for identification. Yes, madam. Very well. Then the next exhibit, exhibit eight, is the will and accompanying map of, of Joanna Talbot. And just remind us who was Joanna Talbot? Joanna Talbot would have been my great great grandmother, the wife of James Talbot, mother of John. And as uh, this document, Madam Chair, is handed as an exhibit, JBA 4G. Four G, enter. Next document, exhibit nine. And this shows the award of 1,000 pounds made to John Tobit for 12 and a half acres with a wooden cottage by the BDC. I uh, set so this document and entry from the Royal Gazette dated February 11, 1921. That's a 10 meters exhibit. JBA 4H. Very well. I'm going to ask that this document be read by the witness when we conclude this exercise. Very well. Exhibit 10. Yes, madam. Um, February 24th, 1921. The final paragraph shows where- It's an entry from the Royal an Gazette. An entry from the Royal Gazette on February 24th, where the jury said, where evidence shows that John Tobit received 600 pounds. And I said this, Extract from the Royal Gazette dated February 24, 1921. Pretend I admit that exhibit JBA 4I. The answer is be read by the witness after we conclude this exercise also. Exhibit 11 is an article out of the Bermuda Magazine. Um, Salma 1996, the article's name is Trading Places. And it speaks to Benjamin Free. Would you be kind enough to repeat the date of that Bermuda Magazine article? Summer 1996. And that document, how many pages is it, madam? Three. That's going as JBA exhibit four. For J. Exhibit 12. Okay. Okay. Just a moment. Continue, madam. Um, that's actually where we where he stopped off. So okay. JBA four. I'm I'm sorry. So not exhibit twelve is a copy of the Royal Gazette, December 9th, 1920, yeah. Now, before we get to that, 
Yes, I'm just going to ask you to go back to what is JBA 4H, which you have labeled, you had labeled Exhibit 9. I'm just going to ask you to read it for the benefit of the record. That's the award of a thousand dollars, thousand something. Of oh, eight thousand two hundred. The reference is on the, that second little page right at the bottom. The case of John Talbot, owner of two pieces of land, aggregating about 12 and a half acres with a wooden cottage was then considered and a total award of 1,000 pounds was made. Yeah, but I thought somebody said 8,000. Oh, he's 8,000. Eight that's the title for the that's paper. The headline. That's the okay. headline. And there are two pages. You'll see a, a larger copy that's easier to read in the back of that. And so that's your exhibit nine. Mm -hmm. And which is and it's JBA for dated February 11th, 1921. Yeah. Correct. Okay. I'm going to ask you not to answer. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Please, when you're speaking to the chair. Yes, my apologies. Okay. You mean with Exhibit 10 to read that or? Or it, the one which has as the title Jury's Award of 8,200 pounds to D.B. Talbot. I'm asking you to read the entire document from the start to the finish so we may have it in the record, please. Okay. Thank you. On Friday 2nd at Tucker's Town, a jury was drawn to assess the value of land owned by Messrs. B.D. and John Tobit. The jury comprised James, James Hill Hollis, foreman, Howard Emmett, Donscombe Smith, Frederick Collins Otterbridge, William Robert Lightwin, Arthur Roberts Wilkinson, George Harrison Otterbridge, and Francis Anthony Hollis. Great interest, excuse me, I'm gonna see if I have a larger copy of this. Just give me a second. Great interest has centered around the expropriation proceedings in connection with the property of B.D. Tobit, one of the largest landowners in Tucker's town. And on the day on which the jury were drawn, Mr. F. Godwin Gosling made on behalf of the development company a final offer, which was rejected by Tobit, who preferred that the case should go before a jury. Mr. Gosling's offer was 10,000 pounds in cash six acres of land in more or less the same district as that in which B.D. Tobit had always lived and 1,200 pounds which, with which to build a house. This rejected offer represented an aggregate of some 12 or 13,000 pounds. An early start in the case was made on Wednesday morning and the jury took from 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. To, in which to view the property comprising 74 acres with a stone house and shop two stone cottages and a stone barn, all in good condition, situated thereon. An interval for lunch and recuperation after the morning strenuous inspections occurred. And at 2.55 p.m., the hearing was resumed. Mr. H.V. Smith, representing Mr. B.D. Tobit and Mr. J.R. Conyers, the Bermuda Development Company. Tobit, having been duly sworn, stated that he estimated the annual rental of his house at 30 pounds for the store at 30 pounds, two cottages, at 36 pounds, and barn at 12 pounds or 14 pounds. He said that his annual income during the past five years from farming for export purposes was 500 pounds. He rents part of his planting land for 60 pounds per annum. 
his grocery business he estimated to be worth 100 pounds per annum, his banana plantation at 100 pounds per annum, his summer crop of melons, corn, et cetera, at 100 pounds per annum, sale of wood and timber at 200 pounds per annum, in addition to which he uses himself firewood valued at three, I can't make, it must be three shillings per diem. The sale of lemons gives him an annual income from eight to 12 pounds, and his seaweed catch is a large one. He was then cross-examined by J Mr. J. R. Cunyas, who stated that according to Tobit's figures, the property yielded an annual income of 1,036 pounds. When asked if this was so, Tobit replied in the affirmative. Further cross-examination revealed the fact that he was 62 years old and earned 300 pounds on mortgage. He knew the Walker property comprising 54 acres, but did not know if it had been sold to the company for 4,500 pounds. Mr. Cunyus stated that 32 acres of Tobit's property was situated on Castle Point and that Tobit had only a right of footway to it. Some questions were asked by the jurors concerning Tobit's estimated annual income of 500 pounds for, for farming. In reply to queries as to how many men he employed, he stated that he employed three men regularly and sometimes as many as 20. Mr. C.W.W. Walker was then called as a witness on the company's behalf and stated that his wife had earned 54 acres of land with house and cottage near Tuckers, near Tuckers Town. This property had been sold to the development company for 4,500 pounds, which he considered a good price. 17 acres of the land was used for planting and the rest was made up of, of trucks pond, grazing and timberland. B.D. Tolbert, when recalled, stated that the company's plans of his property were not quite correct. He earned 83 or 84 acres of land, 34 of which were arable and 22 under actual cultivation, he said. Mr. Conyers, in addressing the jury, analyzed the value of Walker's property and made comparison between it and that of Tobit, which he estimated to be worth 6,500 pounds on the same basis of evaluation, of valuation. He suggested that 7,500 pounds would be a very fair price to pay Tobit. Mr. H.V. Smith contended that what one man sold his property for was no criterion of the value of that of another man. His client was being torn from his home and would be separated from his own people and church. These were, he maintained, most important factors in the case. Worshipful R.W. Appleby then summed up and in doing so emphasized the importance of this case and urged the jury to give it to their most careful consideration. He warned them concerning statements of income and enjoined them not to be influenced by the sale price of Walker property, but to judge Tobit's case on its own merit, as the circumstances pointed out the merits of the property. At 4.30 p.m., the re jury returned a verdict for 8,200 pounds. The case of John Tobit, owner of two pieces of land aggregating about 12 and a half acres with a wooden cottage was then considered and a total award, award of 1,000 pounds made. Thank you. Could I ask that the witness read what is exhibit JBA4I? She has previously labeled it as exhibit 10. Yes, please. Go ahead. Just one second. Yes, counsel. She has asked for a moment, madam. Thank you. Jury gives four thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds to Mr. Otterbridge. Commander Large RN says Castle Harbor is one of best on Atlantic seaboard. One of the most interesting cases of the entire expropriation proceedings consequent upon Mazir's furnace with his entrance into the tourist trade of Bermuda was heard at Walker's house, Tuckerstown, on Tuesday. 
The case in question was that of worshipable THH Otterbridge MCP, owner of some 40 acres of land with a water footage on Castle Harbor. On the land are two stone cottages and a stone barn. Proceedings opened at 11.30 a.m. and a jury comprising Messrs. Arthur Robert Wilkinson Foreman, William Southworth Cooper, John Brian Oswood, Alma Winf Winfred Brown, Francis Anthony Hollis, George Taplin Miller, and Robert Oliver Clifford was impaneled. After the jury had sw been sworn, and other preliminaries gone through that the property in its entirety was viewed. It took until 1.30 p.m. to do this, after which an adjournment was made for lunch. The hearing was resumed at 2.30 p.m. Mr. Otterbridge conducting his own case and Mr. J.R. Conyers, MCP, appearing on behalf of the Bermuda Development Company. Mr. Otterbridge, being duly sworn as a witness on his own behalf, stated that, believing that Castle Harbor would one day be the principal part of Bermuda, he had acquired property now under consideration as a business site. On December 13, 1999, 1919, sorry, Honorable S.S. Sperling on behalf of the development company was given a 90 day option to purchase at $50,000. On March 11, 1920, after the expiration of 89 days, Mr. Sperling wrote him a letter declining to exercise his option on the ground that the price was excessive. In enumerating the special it's covered, of the property, Mr. Otterbridge stated that he earned the largest something frontage on Castle Harbor. And there was, there was a large but undeveloped cave on his land. When cross-examined by Mr. Cunyas as to the price at which he had purchased, he said he didn't know. Mr. Cunyas, did you pay 500 pounds? Mr. Otterbridge, yes, I paid more than that. He did not know how much arable land there was, but valued the land apart from the waterfront at between 5,000 and 6,000 pounds. He did not know on what assessment he paid taxes. His income from the property was 64 pounds per annum. Further questions elicited the information that his purchase price of the various lots, which were now being considered as a whole, was approximately 19. 1,940 pounds. Mr. Otterbridge then summoned as a master's engineer commanding Commander Lodge RN, who stated that speaking as an expert, he considered Castle Harbor to be one of the best harbors on the Atlantic seaboard and capable of such development as would enable it to take the world's largest ships, either naval or of the mer merchant marine. Cross examined by Mr. Cunyas as to whether he knew anything about dredging, he stated that he was not an authority. In reply to a question by Worshipful R.W. Appleby, Chairman of the Board of Commissioners, as to whether it would be a costly matter to develop the harbor, Commander Large stated that he did not think it would be very costly. There was now about 19 feet of water at the entrance, which would, of course, have to be deepened. This is not a large number of there is not a large number of reefs on this particular side of the harbor and such as are there are pinnacle reefs and easily removed. Mr. W.V. Smith, late engineer in charge of channel works was next called as a witness by Mr. Otterbridge. He submitted a plan drawn to scale of Castle Harbor with a plan of St. George's Harbor superimposed. This plan showed the relative size and merit of the two harbors, and Mr. Smith's accompanying report went to show that Castle Harbor possessed many natural advantages over that of St. George's, and that it would be a comparatively simple and inexpensive matter to develop the former. Mr. F. Goodwin Gosling, Secretary of the Bermuda Development Company, was then called as a witness by Mr. J. R. Conyers. He stated that a jury had awarded John Tobit 600 pounds for a seven and a half acre lot near that of Mr. Otterbridge. He knew the cave which had been referred to as an asset. It was unsafe and not capable of development. He assured the jury that it was not the intent of the development company to open up the harbor. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Talbot. Yes. Take us, we'll take, take you back to where we had stopped. Yes. You had referenced what is labeled Exhibit 12. That's correct. It's a Royal Gazette extract from December 9, 1920. That's correct. I wish Madam Chair to have this tendered as an exhibit. It's, it's not going to be DDT? Correct, Madam Chair. One. And would that be DDT one? That's correct, Madam Chair. And that's an RG December 9th, 1920 article? Correct, Madam Chair. Thank you. That's at the witness read the exhibit into the record. It's um, titled, Tucker's Town Jury Gives Mr. Pree 4,000 pounds. On Tuesday morning, another property in the area which was acquired by the Bermuda Development Man Company was valued by a jury. This belonged to Mr. Benedict Priest, owner of about four acres of land in Hamilton Parish. It has a waterfront on Harrington Sound and it contains a large house and a small cottage. The jury awarded him 4,000 pounds. The commissioners met under the chairmanship of, of Major R. W. Ebley, Apple. Apple, sorry, Mr. J. R. Conyers appeared for the company, and Mr. G. C. G. Montague for Mr. Priest. Mr. John Howard Cooper was the foreman of the jury. Mr. H. C. Masters, I believe that senior valued the property as follows. House, 2,000 pounds, cottage, 350 pounds, and land, 850 pounds, of total of 3,200 pounds. Evidence was given as to the improvements carried out by Mr. Priest, by Priest. In addressing the jury, Mr. Montague argued that um, they should take into account the depreciation of the pond. Preet, being an American citizen, used in heavily if he was to transfer the money into US currency, US currency. Against this, Mr. Kanye said that the jury should only consider what they would pay themselves. The above verdict was given. In the early stages of the proceeding, the, the last offer made to Mr. Preet was 2,900 pounds, while 4,000 500 pounds was claimed. During the weekend, the commissioners will view certain properties and hear three cases, which next week, two juries cases will be taken. Thank you. I just ask you to continue with the presentation after you have a sip. Okay, thank you. Uh, to, to continue on, item, item 13, Mr. Stuart McLean of Shipping, Shipping Berg, Shipping Pants Berg, Pennsylvania was awarded uh, 240 pounds for one acre on Harrington Sound. It, it has a, a footnote where it came from. If the, if the same criteria was awarded to John Tobin, sorry, to John Tobin, he could have received 3,000 pounds for his 12.5 acres. Mr. Charles Hollis, 
employed by the Bermuda Development Company, was sold for a lot measuring 100 times 100 feet, less than a quarter of acre, and situated near Mangrove Lake, which was equivalent to the size of the property he earned. A four room cottage with kitchen and all modern um, conveniences was to be built for him. And in addition, he was to be given a hundred pounds in cash pending his wife's agreement. Based on these cal calculations, John Tobin could have received 5,000 pounds and also been com compensated with an equivalent property and earned. Um, Mr. George Smith, Earn of seven acres of land with a stone cottage had agreed to part with his property um, and to accept in exchange a piece of land with two cottages in Smith Parish plus 400 pounds cash. Further investigations were pending, but the office stored for when these items were settled. An equivalent property plus 712 pounds could have been awarded to. John Tobin. Thank you. The documents in support that you rely on. Okay, the first one with pre is exhibit 12. Which we dealt with already. Okay. The, the next three are on the same document is on exhibit 13. And this is the RG day two. Yeah. January 28, 1921, Madam Chair. Uh, so it be tendered and admitted as exhibit DDT2. Two. Two. Uh, so it be read into the record by the witness. It's headline. Tuckerstown land cases are heard. On Tuesday morning, the Tuckerstown commissioners met at the Walker's house in that parish and transacted a very considerable amount of business. The first case to be considered was one which dealt with the estate of Princess Janet Smith and involved all sorts of legal te technicalities as she died interstate, leaving three daughters, Mrs. Clark, Mrs. Eddie, and Mrs. Spencer. Mrs. Clark died some little time ago, leaving three children, all minors. And pending the pr production of her will, no settlement can be arrived at. Ms. Eddie, on her own behalf, and that of Mrs. Spencer, claimed that they were the guardians of the three Clark children and asked that 2,000 pounds, asked 2,000 pounds for the property, comprising approximately 11 acres of land with a stone cottage there on. The case was adjourned whilst further inquiries are made. The next case was to be considered was that of Artemis Leslie Tobin, Owner of 15 acres, 54 purchases of land with a wooden cottage situated thereon. The owner was represented by his brother, B.D. Tobin, who refused the de development company's offer of 1,100 pounds and offered to sell for 2,000 pounds. Mr. Gusson, on behalf of the company, went to 1,600 pounds, which the commission commissioner raised to 1,650 pounds. Tobit refused, and Mr. Gosden then raised his offer to 1,800 pounds, which Tobit finally accepted. The case of George Smith, owner of seven acres of land with a stone cottage, is another very involved one, which could not be settled until further inquiries had been made. Smith had agreed to part with his property and to accept in exchange a piece of land with two cottages in Smith Parish plus 400 pounds. 
It now transpires, however, there, there is some doubt as well to Smith earns the property. It's being claimed that an inmate of the asylum has an interest. Smith denies this and pending further investigation, the case was adjourned. After the commission um, have fortified themselves for lunch, they adjourned to the house recently acquired by the de development company from Benedict Priest. Here's a jury assembly to this. Here, a jury assembled to assess the value of the property approx approximating one acre and belong to George Stuart McLean of Shipping, Shipping Birds, Pennsylvania. It says PA, but the property is situated on Henderson in the endurance that of Mr. Benedict Priest. Mr. G. C. G. Montague appeared on behalf of McLean and Mr. J. R. Conyers on behalf of the de that development company. The property was originally purchased for 166 pounds and the jury awarded its owner 240 pounds. Next was considered the case of Charles Hollis employed by the, de the de development company as the foreman of their works at Takistan. He is the owner of rather less than a quarter of an acre with, with Stern Cottage. Mr. Garson, on behalf of the company, offered to give him a lot measuring 100 times 100 and situated near Mangrove Lake, a full room cottage with kitchen and all modern conveniences will be built for him. And in addition, he'll be given a hundred pounds. This cash offer was accepted by Hollis, subject to his wife's approval of the proposed site. The commissioners then executed orders vesting the properties of A. E. Bourne, C. R. W. Darrell, and T. I. O'Connor in the company. The next meeting of the commissioners will be held at Takistan today, where the jury beside other besides other business will be drawn to consider the cases of B. D. Tob B. D. and John Tobin, two of the largest landowners in Takistan. You may continue. Okay. okay. The next is comparisons of similar property in today's market. And I have to testify that this has not been prepared by lawyers or or, or real estate agents, but it's done just by late late person. Okay. The first one highlights that um, Regal Suburb International Realty advises on their website, and it gets the website um, www.regalsuburbrealty.com. Site 1A of Leave Hill, Hamilton Parish, which measuring one. Also, um, if, if I may pause for a moment, are we going to enter? The RG Jan 20, 1921 article as an exhibit? We did already, Madam Chair. It is DDT2. DDT2? DDT2. DDT2. I think um, I have. Yes, I do have it. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You may continue, sir. Uh, okay. Site so 1A, Leave Hill, Hamlet Parish, measuring 1.34 acres for Bermuda dollars, $2,950,000 um, Bermuda dollars, I'm sorry. And that's 
um, this is uh, exhibit 14. Now, based on these calculations, the value of drawn over 12.5 acres of land, which would be 27 million. $518,657.70. And there is a document that the witness refers to as Exhibit 14, which he prays in aid of the comparisons that he has, that have been done. I ask that it be tendered and admitted as Exhibit DDT3, Madam. It's and what do we um, it's identify it as? At the it's, it's named about site one A Glebe Hill. That's one moment Glebe. about site one A Glebe Hill. That is so, Madam D D D D T three. Okay. Three. So entered council. The document which you place reliance on, please read it into the record for me, please. Sure. Thank you. About site 1A BP set high above Bermuda's prestigious community of Takastan, sit this magnificent parcel of land available for private residential development. Glebe Hill Site 1A offers a rare opportunity to enjoy a 180 degree view of Hanton Sound, the South Shore, and the world class Tucker's Point Golf Course. Create your stunning 4,500 4, square foot private residence with panoramic views on this 1.337 acre freehold home site amidst uh, resort amenities from golfing, tennis, spa, fitness center, restaurants, retail shop, peak sand beaches, and much more. Be here within less than 10 minutes from Bermuda's Al F. V. International Airport and conveniently 25 minutes into town for additional dining and shopping within the city of Hamilton. The $25 million renovation of the Riverswood Bermuda Hotel and Resort will provide world-class conveniences for you and your guests. The site is available to Bermudians, PRCs, and international purchases, and it has the purchase price down below of Two million nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Just to understand, sir, regarding the location of Mr. James Talbot mm -hmm. and his holdings. To your knowledge, is it is it in the same locale as the document that you refer to there? It it's in Takastan, but if it, you ask me if it's on that specific um site, that's unknown. It's unknown. It's unknown, you say. Unknown, yeah. But you reference this to give a comparative price about, of about Takastan, yes. You may proceed. Sir. Okay. The next is um is KW Bermuda advertises on their website www.kwbermuda.com. Lantana. Let's let let's drive Sandys. Measure nine point seven three acres. For Bermuda for sixteen million nine hundred thousand Bermuda dollars, and that's um, known as our document exhibit fifteen. 
So based on all these calculations. Um, just, just, just a minute. It's okay. And I'm sure I'd ask that the document which the witness would like to place reliance, which is labeled Exhibit 15, Land Tanya. I'd ask that that document be exhibited as Exhibit DDT. Four. Four, thank you. Thank you. It's so entered. Thank you. Please read that document for us. Okay. Into the record. It's titled Lantana, and it's just uh, the price of sixteen million nine hundred thousand Bermuda dollars. Sandy's Bermuda. The listing ID is one zero eight eight dash six six fifty. The stunning and sprawling former Lantana College colony is up for sale. The 9.73 acre Sandish property with treatment views of the Great Sound and extension, extensive waterfront is truly a gem of Bermuda. The gently terraced slope from the Azure waters below take you to the highest point with 360 degree views overlooking this most peaceful and private place. A vast secluded estate borders the property to the west and the iconic railway trail, a national park and treasure to the north. It's perfect for hiking and biking uh, throughout, through the island. Lantana, the island's first college colony opened in 1958. In its prime, boasted extensive formal gardens, a croquet, croquet layer lawn, sorry, tennis court, and a pool to complement the highly desired Bermuda College lifestyle popular with locals and visitors alike. Now cleared, the land is a blank slate for developers. Many mature palms remain as well as an extensive dock and small beach. The property is sent for tourism that allows for residential use. Permission from previous planning approvals included 28 hotel condominiums, 13 residents, a beach pavilion, pools, and a clubhouse. Simply stated, this is a unique opportunity to purchase one of the most charming properties in Bermuda with rare, buildable waterfront. Bermuda is a beautiful and safe destination. There's a straightforward pro process, process to develop and have a sophisticated infrastructure and qualified business operators. The government bodies have put their full support behind residential tourism and welcome investors and developers. With our team at Keller Williams, ready to give knowledgeable guidance, and this is the this is a development opportunity not to be missed. You had answered me indicating that the, the pronunciation I think is Glebe Hill. Apologies if I do it incorrectly. You had made reference to this 2.95 million property Mm -hmm. which is, a, a, for my words, adjoining next to Tucker's town. No, you have, you're making reference to property in Lantania, Sandy, Bermuda. You'd agree with me that Glebe Hill and Sandy's are in two different locations. Yes, sir. But you rely now on the Lantania, Sandy's Bermuda, which is 16.9 million. Now, could you just share with us exactly the, I know you're using for comparative purposes, but in you're using it ultimately to speak to what the value of the property that your, is it your great grandfather had? Right. 
Could you just share with us the, the point that your illustration you're trying to make? Sure. There are two different places. Sure. As um, you had mentioned, Lantana being in Sandy's, but what Lantana offers is that something that is close to the size of the property that my great grandfather had. Yeah. Um, it's not, I don't know if in Bermuda we can purchase 12.5 or 14.5 um, acres of land, of virgin land right now. So Lantana was used as that's, that's the closest that we can find. In size. In size, yeah. Okay. Whereas the first one was used because, because it's it, it, right in Pakistan. Okay. All right. Thank you. You may continue. Miss, well, I think Miss, Mrs. Adams, you will continue mm -hmm. again. Comments from the history of Mid Ocean Club. McDonald and Redmore scored the eye. Just, just for a moment, you're on page six page of six. the exhibit JBA2. Yes. Thank you. Please continue. McDonald and Redmore scoured the island and identified 500 acres at Tucker's Town as being ideal for the project. It was estimated that the land could be purchased for between $150,000 and $200,000. However, it proved to be far from a simple process. As McDonald wrote later, practically every one of the owners who had given an option on his property went back on his contract but finally it resulted in securing about 600 acres at a cost of about $600,000. These two entries demonstrate that money was a driver for the development of Tucker's Town. Their concern was about developing a playground for the rich and famous, and not about the welfare and livelihood of the landowners, once again highlighting lack of humanitarianism. In 1951, Following a decline in tourism as a direct result of the downturn in the economy because of World War II, Furnace Vithi were looking to sell off the property. It was eventually brought by a group of local bankers, businessmen, and others invested in the property and transitioned it from a commercially owned tourist attraction to a select and discreet members club was achieved with telling and lasting results. Some of the individuals involved in this were also instrumental in the Takastan expropriation of land. It could be said that they saw a business opportunity and took advantage of it. With their finances, they were in a good position to do so. If their intent was honorable, they would have developed a club that would have been inclusive, not exclusive, or discreet, as they said they would have ensured that the families of the community that were displaced and disenfranchised could have the opportunity to enjoy the amenities of the property too. This was not to be because racism reared its ugly head yet again in a still very divided island. The first black person to play at Mid-Ocean Club, Mid Club did so in the late 1960s while the first black member was accepted only in 1973. I just pause there and just indicate. Madam Chair, I know Council from Mid-Ocean Club Limited has standard stand in and he may wish to know of his statement made. So I just, as a courtesy, place it on the record, and probably his attention could be brought to it through us of the statement made, even though he is a limited liability portion of the company. Okay. Um, may I make a statement? So just a, just okay. a moment. Just a moment. So uh, in terms of giving him notice, uh, should we send him the transcript or uh, we can send this document. Is, we can send this document, document because okay. the, the witness is reading from it. So we can send this to Good him document. and well. he can determine if I'll just make a note of it. And please, um, Secretary, if you'll be kind enough to make a note that Mr. Adamson is who has standing.
is to receive, is to be provided. with a copy of the document. And, and particularly, it's at page six, the last paragraph. Page six, the last paragraph of exhibit JBA2. Page six, last paragraph. Of exhibit J B A two. I got that right. J B A two. That is so. Thank you. You could go ahead. I'd like to say that most of these references came off the Mid Ocean website um, for their history Thank and you. from one of their newsletters. Thank you very much. Very important. Yeah, the footnotes will indicate that. Thank okay. you. Financial implications for purchase of Tucker's Town. For all its progress, Furnace Vivi was pushing the limits of Bermudian sensibility. Locals regarded foreign enterprise as a Trojan horse of monopoly. So far, the saving grace had been that the colony's commercial elite equated the project. project with its own economic agenda. The indication of financial gains to be made by the Bermudian businessman on the takeover of Tucker's Town, excuse me, is mentioned here by their partners at Furnace Vining, Vivi. Royal Gazette editor, Arthur Purcell, under the pen name Samuel Pep Pepis Tusser, portrayed the development company's new secretary, Godwin Gosling as the hot air behind the dollar, running about at the back and call of a soulless corporation. Once again, we see the signs of the financial implications of the Tuckerstown expropriation. Lewis found a more active partner in F. Godwin Gosling, scion of the prominent liquor trading family. Gosling was another tourism booster who in 1920 held the influential position of assistant colonial secretary. He also owned land in Tucker's Town, 100 acres of it. In 1907, he had purchased a small house, the clearing, on the edge of Tucker's Town Bay. Lewis thus found in Gosling, both a Bermuda lieutenant and a location for his golf course. Within a year, Gosling resigned his colonial post and went into the company's employ. Gosling obviously saw the financial implications for himself. To move from the prestigious and paid position of colonial secretary of the house and work for the American group most likely would be more financially lucrative. Also, his family's company would benefit from the liquor sales to the new hotel because of his affiliation with and perhaps impact on the Furnace Withy team. Further, his property would gain value in that location. Your petitioners have already expended a very large sum to purchase steamers for the New York Bermuda service and, contempl and contemplate increasing their fleet in the near future and feel strongly that the apathetic or unreasonable attitude of a few small landowners should not be permitted to block an enterprise of such great importance to the full development of the colony as a tourist re resort, excuse me, and thus to prevent the company from re reaping a reasonable financial benefit from their investment. This statement yet again demonstrates the fact that the expropriation was about certain persons and companies reach reaping financial benefits. Impact of the Bermuda Development Company expropriation on families in Tucker's town. According to Duncan McDonald, about three quarters of residents had already agreed to sell, but a minority was holding out despite a liberal offer of cash or replacement home elsewhere. The holdouts were motivated by indifference and a failure to grasp the great advantage which will accrue to themselves and their neighbors from the English company's benef beneficence. Furnace Vivi therefore requested not just an act of incorporation, but also a limited measure of compulsion by which the holdouts could be dealt with in a just 
and reasonable manner. Most of the individuals who stood their ground were penalized. Our great grandfather, John Samuel Tobit, declined to settle for an offer. He stood up for himself, his family, his home on a matter of principle. He did so with pride and fortitude. For this, he paid. What the purchaser called indifference was the commitment to family and community, the tie to the land through at least three generations, and the place my grandfather knew as home. What he grasped was the need to observe Maslow's law of hierarchy needs for physiological safety, belongingness, and love, esteem, and self-actualization for his family. The Bermuda Development Company made a point during some of the hearings of stating that properties measured a certain acreage or thereabouts. This demonstrates the company's disregard and contempt toward the landowners by not thoroughly reviewing deeds, wills, etc., for preciseness. This occurred despite the fact that they went to inspect the land prior to each case. John Tobit was cut short of two acres of his land, whether deliberate or a mistake. This I'm is- sorry, I'm sorry, I think Eric Adair says cut short of payment. Of payment of two acres of his land, I'm sorry. Whether deliberate or a mistake, this is incomprehensible. His land had been clearly delineated in the wills of both his parents. The final paragraph of the Bermuda Development Act number two states that there was some protest by a few residents in the neighborhood against the compulsory acquisition of land by the company. But there is no doubt that the acts as they stand represent the wishes of the great majority of the inhabitants of the colony. The Bermuda Development Property Act was enacted in parliament by parliamentarians who were part of the Family and Friends Club, who individually and as families stood to profit from the proposed development of the area. The company only makes reference to those residents who signed the petition, totally omitting individuals like John Samuel Tobit who forced their hand in court. Those individuals will certainly swell the numbers. Further, as black people were not allowed to vote at that time, despite being a majority, so who or what majority were the BDC representing as they suppose, as the supposedly free black Bermudian population were not considered their constituents. This is with the exception of Dr. T.H. Otterbridge, MCP for St. George's, who stood by the sentiments of his constituents and presented the petition to the house on behalf of the 24 freeholders, 22 black and two white. He voted against the Bermuda Development Company Act along with one other person. The bill further indicated that acquisition of the lands by the company could be made without consent of the owners if they were adverse to partnering with them. A strong, viable, self-sufficient, self-sustaining community in Tuckerstown who lived off the land and sea was uprooted, displaced, and disenfranchised. Until today, that land is still off limits to majority of Bermuda's black population, unless, as in most cases, they work there. However, in stark comparison, the families of some of those individuals who either served in the parliament of the day or in the Bermuda Development Company, the jury, the appeals tribunal, or were in any other way directly involved in the debacle, reside in Tuckerstown and or get to utilize the amenities there, not the family of my great grandfather. Our legacy was ripped away from us. Tuckerstown was curtained off from the rest of the colony along lines of wealth and race. In a psychological sense, it almost ceased to be a part of Bermuda. Here we are on the brink of entering 2021. And today, this is still the case. Tuckerstown is still curtained off. It is my hope that through the findings of this commission, this curtain will rise and begin a new era in Bermuda, where it opens new roads into Tuckerstown for the disenfranchised descendants of those unfairly expropriated from their homes. Yeah, it's exhibit 16. Now, exhibit six, what you refer to as exhibit 16. 
that, that final statement. That, that re saying. represents a final statement mm -hmm. of yourself and Mr. Talbot. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is the submission of Joanne B. Adams, Bernice, and Dwayne Disney Talbot to the Land Laws Commission explaining and demonstrating why we claim that our great grandfather was not adequately compensated and that the whole process of the forced expropriation was unjust. Thank you. I'd ask that the, what is referred to as exhibit 16, it's a final statement, joint final statement by Mrs. Adams and Mr. Talbot. I'd ask that it be tendered and admitted as, <clears throat> excuse me, as exhibit. JBA, JBA five. JBA five, Madam Chair. And Adams. This is the picture. Told us. Entered as exhibit JBA5. What, what do you have there, madam? This is a picture of a home in Earl Tucker's town on the water side. And the property which my grandfather owned was on the water side in Tucker's town. And we just looked at this as a home. And it could have been his home. It, could, it represents the home and the heart of the people of Tucker's town. I would ask that this way, mark by identity two. You'd like it to be marked for? Identity. Identity, okay. As number two. And would you repeat that, Ms. Adams, as to what it depicts? It depicts the home, I feel, and the heart of this, uh, ancestors who lived in Tuckers You say the park? Heart. 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 Copy. Mm -hmm. And whom? And the life they lived. The boats are there where they fished. Fishing area. I've marked it as two for identification. Mrs. Adams, have you ever been able to identify the actual aerial acreage, place, point of the holding, land holding of your I, descendant, Mr. Talbot, James Talbot? I can't, I didn't have maps with me. I was actually recently down there and getting angry but looking at the land and I would say, and based on the map, but I, like I said, I didn't have it with me. Um, it was near Mid Ocean Club um, where there's, because based on the map, there's actually like a pond in the area. And then basically the what? on the map that is accompanied with um, Joanna Tobit's will. It is actually right on the water side and it would look like it's in that area. But I haven't done any real place the map over and you know get somebody to go down there and look. This is just based on my picture in my head of the map and what the area looked like. So you really the family yourself from Sir Talbot would really love to know where the actual spot was. Oh, definitely. Yes, definitely. We were trying to look at it actually up until last night. Um on was it land valuation? Yeah. Land valuation where they have you can look at aerial shots and zoom in. Um, but we didn't have the capacity to be able to take the map and overlay it in the area. So and is that one of the things that you would ask the commissioners to consider at the end of this inquiry for you to yourself and Mr. Talbot to be to not to be told or to it definitely. to be identified for you definitely. what is and there now. Yes, definitely. Just 
go, go ahead, sir. Just as a matter of reference, from the from the quick look that we took, again, the person um, extensive, but it appeared to be close um, to the area that is called Shao. What's it called? Child Point Red. That's where it looks. Um, if we can con identify concretely, but that's where it looks to be. And one of the things that you would have. And that's for the um, for Joanna's property, passed to, um, to her son. Thank you. And one of the things that you would like also like to ask is that if any way Mid Ocean Company Limited could help you to identify just for posterity, just for that sense of connection. Of knowledge, yeah, of yes. connection, yes. You, if they could facilitate it, yes. Mid Ocean Company Limited, you'll be only so happy. Yes, yes and sir. actually, we would want to extend that to some of our other family members because. Um, the, one of the reasons we really decided to do this, we have a cousin, we had a family reunion a couple of years ago. Um, and one of my cousins did a lot of research and she came back and she actually read that piece I read mm. about where, um, was it B.D. Tobit and what he had on his land. Mm. And um, she read some pieces from James and Joanna as well that she had found. She went and did some research and, um, like that was, we stood on the hillside over at Oswood Cove and it was probably about a hundred of us, I guess. Mm. And she, we stood under the trees one hot sunny day and listened to her read that. And it was amazing. And the fact that I'm named Joanne really made me feel good mm. because here's this great woman named Joanna. And um, Disney from there did a, um, a family tree on Ancestry. And um, we, you know, we, we, we call each other and talk about it all the time. And the only place we could go right now, um, we had two reunions and the first one was only one day, one afternoon, and we picnicked at Doc's Puddle on the old field. And my great grandparents and my, um, our grandparents actually, and he spent, we spent summers there. Right. Where Doc's Puddle is now, the condo, we actually, um, it was a house on the hill in the trees, and we used to stay, my grandparents stayed there. I didn't know my grandfather, my great grandfather, I knew my grandmother, great grandmother, Ma Tobit, and I have a very distinct picture of her in my head. Um, but we picnicked there because that was the spot where we could call home for all intents and purposes. Uh, my grandparents, they were all born out there. Thank you. Sir. And, and just, sorry, just one moment. Uh, Madam Chair, I know it's not only time that we would break. However, I have only about three or four questions. And seeing that I think we're at the end, could I just ask the forbearance just to oh, yes. allow us to go for another 15 Certainly minutes? Certainly proceed, Council. Okay, thank you. And you, you may continue, sir. And where some of my interest came from is as, as I go through the highways and byways of Bermuda. Um, the first question is, well, when I um, say who I am, are you told it from Harrison Bay, Takistan area? And I told them, I'm, I'm not sure, but then, but during the family tree, you can clearly see that um, from James and Joanna, and upwards, they were from Takasan. Um, you can clearly see that um, that something took place. Rather, it was during this 1921 era, 1920s era, and stuff. But something took place to force my great grandfather and his wife and their children round to yeah. Bayless Bay. And um, so my answer to the folks that asked me on the highways and byways um, was no, I'm from Bayless Bay. But um, I do, afterwards, we do, did see the connection between us at Bayless Bay, I'm um, told, and uh, Takistan. And you say that to say that you really would like 
to have this issue settled. So to know exactly. To, to know exactly who we are, what took place, why it took place, and what can be done about, um, about it. Okay, thank you. Just to go back to you a bit, Mrs. Adams, you had indicated earlier to us at the very start that there was a document which has been exhibited as JBA 2 and JBA 3. One is dated November 20th, 2020. The other is dated November 26th, 2020. Right. Could you just tell us what's the difference between the two? Because we... Okay, one difference is that... Oh, well, tell us all the differences. What's okay, I'm, I'm going to say one of them. Okay, I will tell you... Um, one of the differences that in the 2021, we didn't have... Sorry, both of them were 20. 20, the 20, 20, the November 20th one yes. did not have the exhibits included. Okay. So they're included in the other one. Um, there was a change in the location of, just one second. We switched around. The final statement, what I made, was actually the second last statement, and we decided that Sorry, was the, the final statement. The final the statement on page nine. This is the on the in the, in the twenty sixth. I crave Andrews. Um, exhibit JBA 5, the, the joint statement by yourself and your brother. Yes. Cousin, cousin. But no. so, I'm sorry, my, my, my apologies. Right. I'm my brother's keeper. Yes, so you are, right. yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. This is what you refer to. Right. Yeah. So JBA that 5, yes. final statement is was located. It wasn't located as the last statement on, on the 20th one. It was the second last statement. And then the statement that starts the bill for the and, sorry before we go to that other so this one you it was there but located somewhere else just a, a one place in front of it okay. yeah okay. go to your next point i'm sorry um there was a mention in 2020 20th <laughs> the 20th of um dina smith yes um, we pulled that one statement out, that one line. Okay. And um, so, it, so it does not appear in. It the, does not appear in, in the twenty six. The, the JBA three does not appear in JBA three. No. Um, and the others were just little typos. They were basically corrections and typos. Okay, thank you. Now, in respect of the document which has been marked A for identity. It is a will of James Talbot, the one that you had indicated, or I had indicated, it was a microfilm document which the investigator had made reference to. Mm -hmm. I am going to ask you that we may need you to come back or we may have the investigator call to produce it. Okay. But I, I, I know you made reference to it, but the investigator, as you indicated, had alluded to transcribing it. Yes. But we may need to have the, we may call the investigator to put that microfilm document and to have the will itself tendered in its present form, Madam Chair. Can I just take you back? You had indicated earlier, Mrs. Adams, in relation to the thousand pound mm -hmm. value for the property, or not the value, but the sale price. Mm -hmm. You also had alluded to the extracts from the Royal Gazette, which spoke to 600 pounds. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you pointed out, which is simple math, the difference. Right. Mm -hmm. 
in that regard that is specifically what you refer to when you say the it was unfair in terms of what the sale price was mm -hmm. yeah and in reference to what other people got yeah and what other people got i know we went through it you're saying other people of a similar status got more or less well got more is that yes. what you're saying yes and for less the, the value of some of the sizes of the property there was less property and they got way more money based on that so that's why i did those calculations to show uh, the difference did you does your did your research are they the documents which you relied on in support, which are exhibits, indicate whether or not the persons who got more, whether they were black or white? Um, not intention. Some of them may have, um, but by names. You're not sure? No. Okay, not sure. Just yeah, we knew that Preeth was an American. That was that Preeth was an American, and they made adjustments for him based on the fact that he's gonna lose because he's gonna change his money to to dollars. So that there, I think, well, that's a prejudice because he's getting treated differently because he's American. Um, and I think the part that about um, Gosling just at his ad hoc manner of how he assigned money there was no set there didn't appear to be any set criteria he just said oh we'll give you this and this and we'll give this person this and this and this and so that's what when i started reading through that that's what made me think hmm, this really shows that it was not it was done nearly really it wasn't done with any set criteria base on how people were going to be assigned funds or otherwise. And I would think, well, the way I believe, um, and people may say, well, we do that now, but we didn't do it then, but that's not necessarily the truth, is that things should have been so much per acre and it was us, everybody would get similar sorts of amounts. Okay. I know that we don't have the will at this time, but the document marked A for identity. I just like to draw your attention to it because I would like us to get an understanding as to the amount of land, the acreage that we are talking about. That is, in terms of us tracing title as we have been seeking mm -hmm. to do, we don't have the amount of the land. Right, that the land, Based on the two wheels, he should have had a total of 14.5 acres, but he, only, but he was compensated for 12.5 acres. Okay. That's what you're talking about. Am That's what I'm referring to in terms yeah. of what it is that was being passed from mm -hmm. the, through the will. Right. Okay. Madam Chair, I have nothing further at this time. Commissioners, do you have questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Good afternoon, Mrs. Adams and Mr. Tolbert. Oh. Uh, possible break point, so I just thought yes. I'd bring that to the attention of the chair. Yeah, but Commissioner, that asks that. Okay. No, no, I'll be my usual so yes, thing. And Madam Chair, because there are no other witnesses today, I just think it's best to complete. I'm fine. I just thought I'd bring it to your attention. Thank Good you. afternoon, Ms. Adams, Mrs. Adams, and Mr. Talbot. Um, I, in particular, I'm um, addressing this question to Mr. Talbot with regard to the comparison of properties. Okay. Um, Generally, I mean, and a, a qualified appraiser right. will have many methods right. uh, to determine the fair market value right. of a property. 
And in this case, um, they would have used what is called the direct sales comparison approach, mm -hmm. which means they would have looked at properties that have recently sold in a similar location, um, similar size and so forth to determine mm -hmm. what the fair market value would be. Um, it looks like from what you've given here, uh, you've indicated what the list price of these properties right. are, is that correct? That's correct. And could you tell me why um, uh, you did not seek maybe the professional services of a qualified appraiser to give information pertaining to the properties indicated? Well, with, with time being of the essence, um, because um, when we wrote in, we wrote in in June, um, the next time we heard of anything to do with the commission as far as us sub submitting was approximately about three weeks ago. So with time being of the essence, they didn't want to, to, um, to hold anything up and stuff like that. So th therefore, just as, as I stated earlier, just a layman's type of, of, of calculation was done. Um, if need being of, of getting an appraisal value of it, um, my cousin and I will investigate that and, and see if that's, that's required. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Go ahead. Good afternoon. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. I noticed that you mentioned the petitioners. Mm -hmm. Did uh, Mr. Talbot, John Talbot, was he a signatory to the petition? No, he wasn't. Uh, another question was, uh, did any of the petitioners follow up in the courts on, on the valuation issue? Um, let me just, just take a look at the petitions. I think one or two did. I remember a couple of names. It'll be very interesting to get that judgment uh, from the courts on valuation. Yeah. Um, I think maybe Eliza Harriet told it. I might have seen something on her, okay. but I the reason I didn't look for that specifically is because I was zoning in on James Hobbit and yeah. trying to keep all the focus on what happened around him. And I did bring in other people, but that was in relative to um, what I could find, you know, because finding some of this is, was difficult. I did a lot of reading and research and trying to get into it. <laughs> late nights, trying to gather information. So some of it, I pick what I thought was most pertinent and some of it, I, I may not have even looked at that name at that time. So I didn't do any sort of comparison like that. Thank you. Council, if she finds that information, could she send it as an addendum and are we able to accept it? Okay, or we could certainly have her appear just for five minutes, just to put it in evidence. And that could be done also by Zoom if necessary. Sorry? And that could be done also by Zoom also. Indeed. So uh, certainly, Madam, if you're able to find that information, if you'll inform the secretary, uh -huh. and um, we will ensure that you're able to put it in evidence. But no pressure is being put on you. It's just a request. <laughs> uh, question? Yes? Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Um, I have a few questions. I'll try to be quick. Um, 
I think I need more coffee. I didn't fully understand the, the bit where that you mentioned on page two and page eight that he was awarded, uh, was it $1,000 for 10 acres? A thousand pounds. Th sorry, a thousand pounds. Which would have been, a, according to this, it would have been, he got, he got five acres, he was received 400 pounds. But he was awarded by the Bermuda by the expropriation yes, yes. for a thousand pounds for the. He had a total of a thousand pounds, four hundred pounds of which came from the sale of the land that was um, five acres. So he didn't receive the full award he that he was right. awarded. He actually had seven acres of the land, so he didn't get a full reward. And then the other six hundred pounds was where he um, where he had the seven point five because that. What his mother game was seven point five acres. Okay, thank you. On um, page five, you have the purchase prices on comparison. Yeah. Um, and I noted I can't remember the net uh, exhibit number. I think it was exhibit number twelve. Mm -hmm. It was in the Royal Gazette article concerning uh, Preeth. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing. Yes, that's right. And um, I noticed that the main payment for his property was actually for the stone house that he had for the large house mm -hmm. um, and I think you mentioned that your ancestor had a wooden cottage or a wooden house right correct so I was just wondering if that might have been a factor in the different property evaluations it could have been well he had three James Tolbert actually had three buildings on his property and um, three or four and I read that. And um, my grandfather, I, my great grandfather, I think had one. So, but they, they distinctly said, we're, we don't have to take, we're not necessarily taking consideration of that because what one man wants is not what another man wants. Yeah. So there again, I think demonstrates that they had no criteria for how they were going to expand monies. They were just, making choices as they saw fit. Okay, I have one final question, staying on page five. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, a Mr. Stuart McLean, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Charles Hollis, uh, Mr. George Smith, mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Benjamin uh, Priot. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned elsewhere about the, the racial nature of the time. Mm -hmm. Do you have any indication about the, the race, racial identification of those members that you use for comparison? Um, or able to hazard a yes? Um, no. Okay. No. That's cool. I just wanted to explore that. No. Cool. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Charlie. Ms. Bins? Yes. Good day, um, Mrs. Adams, Mr. Yeah. Good, good afternoon. Um, just one point of clarification. Um, James Talbot, the father of, of your great, great grandfather, right. um, originally purchased 103 or more acres in 11 lots of property in Tuckerstown. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and your great grandfather, John Samuel Talbot was, uh, he actually was veiled, um, you know, what mm -hmm. he was a beneficiary of from two separate um, right. uh, um, gifts. Do you know how, because it, we have an indication of who he would have bought the property from, mm -hmm. and that's Benjamin Dickinson Harvey. His mm -hmm. ears. Sorry, the ears, the ears off? Yes. Yeah. From that, um, can you not locate where the property was actually located? Because I think there is a map um, that would give you an indication um, of if you look in the archives, um, right. where that property was actually located. Right, we have the map of Joanna's. Yes. Which was the, he shared it between her, the children and a couple of other relatives. Um, so we actually have, a map that she insisted be kept with the the um, will. Yes. Um, but 
I, I would we would have to research that further. Okay, but my question is centered around um, the eleven lots of property. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether that was in one area or throughout? They were basically in one area. Um, A couple were a little bit apart, but they were basically in one area. Like some were over the other side of the pond and things like that. So they were a little bit away. Okay. Um, but it seemed to concentrate from what we could see on one area. Right. It, it would be interesting to find out if, you know, the lots were sold as um, there it's indicated here in 11 lots, um, what each lot would have, um, you know. What each person would, got for their would have been paid, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, because I'll check to see if there are any records. Yeah, it seems to be that there is a sort of, like you said, a random way of valuing mm -hmm. the property. Right. I know in the case of Dinah Smith, they actually looked at the property and started to devalue the, the from a visual inspection. Mm -hmm. They started to devalue the property, mm -hmm. and looking for ways in which, um, you know, that value didn't uh, generate what the property was actually worth. Right. So. Um, I, that was one of my main questions is to find the location and what was actually paid for the 11 lots. And then that will give you an indication um, from there what was actually paid in terms of your grandfather's property. Okay. Or great grandfather. I did see some of the names, like Princess Jennings. That was her sister, right? That's um, Joan Samuel's sister. Joan Samuel's sister. That's one of James's daughters. So I did see her name. We read that earlier on. So. Mm -hmm. A couple of them did appear, mm -hmm. and um, also we, we can look because B.D. Tolbert represented, he was a brother, so he represented a lot of them, it's seemingly in the case. Okay. And when I went to land valuation looking for things, the man was buying a property like left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. I found tons of stuff. I right. couldn't, so I actually saw him and his wife constantly purchasing, mm -hmm. but I didn't see a lot of and some other family members purchased here and there, but he had this thing about land and right. the value of land. One so, last question. Was he a member of parliament? BD told it? Yes. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Stavo. Good, good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yes. 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 <laughs> um, Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I, I have a couple of questions sort of along similar lines and perhaps have been usurped by a couple of my fellow commissioners. Um, is it fair to say that based upon the evidence that you provided, there was proper consideration given to certain aspects of development activity and development potential? for some property owners and not for others. Could you repeat that? Is it fair to say that based upon the evidence that you have provided, there was proper consideration given to certain aspects of development, meaning what was on the property, the activity, meaning the business concerns or commercial concerns uh, and development potential, meaning speculative aspects or location and potential future business possibilities um, for some property owners and not for others? I would, I would say, yeah. Hmm? Well, well the, the, I, I would prefer for you not to collaborate okay. on the answer. Okay. No, I guess I, either I you know ahead. or you don't know. Well, I'm just asking your opinion, and, and it's based on the evidence that you provide. On the, on the evidence that were provided, it, it shows that um, something wishy washy took place. Um, rather, it was what you had stated about um, some some properties being valued at a certain way and others being valued at, at a negative way. Um, I guess that would be for the, a question to the, the folks back then, but it, it appears that something wishy-washy took place. 
my answer is no. I just think some people were afforded more things than other, but I don't, I still don't think there was a real set of criteria. It was still being done in a real ad hoc type manner. So, um, and the one person who I think it speaks to actually was the same man who was the, um, um, I think it is, the, the uh, MCP of the day who said, who represented, um, who represented, um, who, who signed off on the petition, who took the petition to the parliament out of reach. Otterbridge took the petition to Parliament, but he also had land on there. And he had, a, he had bought 100 acres of land speculating that in the future it might bring him money. But, but he, they still didn't pay him what he thought he was worth. So he kind of, so that's why, and, and maybe he was penalized because- I think he, that was a different Otterbridge, which the historically- uh, the confused in, in, right that's what i wanted one was because, a teetotaler and one was a uh, yeah it was uh, I, because it, they had the the same initials but something was a little different right but yes. the initials were the same yeah so i wondered about that but he because i was thinking if this guy is i think the first one was a lawyer i think the the, the mcp but the other person i it didn't gel for me because he didn't know how much land he bought. He didn't know how much he paid for it. He didn't know whose was next to it. But so how could he be re re representing people? I would have, you know, you know, that sort of, so that would fall into place by with him being an alcoholic, maybe a different mm -hmm. person because the level of interaction he would have had to have with the landowners and to be a member of parliament as opposed to, he should have known that information of his own property. So that's why I was conflicted there. So, so what I'm- I think know that everybody was, I just think they threw it out there and every, they allotted what they wanted to, to whomever, but I think some people got an upper end of it and others didn't. Okay. And some uh, people may have been preferred because of race and got more, but I still think that wasn't even done evenly. Okay. Because Fair remember enough. there were, there were white people, there were two white people who signed the petition. Yes. Okay. You've kind of answered my second question as well. Okay. So I, that's all for me, uh, Madam Chair. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you Thank Trevor. you very much. Anything arising council from nothing? nothing? Uh, well, Thank you, uh, Mrs. Ms. Adams and Mr. Tolbert. Um, that's the end of your evidence. Um, I should indicate that uh, because uh, Mid-Ocean has adverse notice mm -hmm. and they have been granted permission to recall any witness, mm -hmm. of course, they'll have to come to the, the commission in order mm -hmm. to do so. Uh, they, if they make an application, then we might recall you. Okay. But um, just bear that in mind. But you're free to go unless you're here otherwise. Okay, thank you. And thank you. In, in closing, I would just like to thank um, the Commission of Inquiry for, and, and Council and, and Sports that for affording us the opportunity to, to present to you. Um, at the end of the day, it's my opinion that I just want some truth of the whole matter to be to to be put on record so that everyone knows what took place and what um what maybe folklore and stuff like that. Um, so again, thank you for that opportunity, and um, we'll wait await hearing from you. Yeah, thank you. I second that. And Lovely. if you do it again, I'm coming with yeah. Cambridge Beaches. <laughs> 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 Miss Fourth would know about that. <laughs> I didn't have enough time. That's the other side of my family. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.